Thank you. The, really, the purpose of tonight's effort is to is to award the bid uh, so that the project can be completed uh, in a timely manner. A couple of things that uh, certainly you may want to discuss are the, uh, some of the proposed uh, deductions um, and the um, possibly some of the financing. But the recommendation is as follows. The superintendent recommends approval of the base bid at $15,776,900 with the reductions noted at $239,694 plus bid alternate number six, uh, which was a $0 add, and that was for train equipment and controls as a preferred alternate as provided by Beam Construction Company for a total sum of $15,527,206. The superintendent recommends pursuing additional funding sufficient to reinstate some of the items uh, removed above to the contract, plus provide a 3% minimum project contingency from the Board of County Commissioners at a future meeting. And be certainly uh, happy to take, uh, take on any questions. Okay, uh, I would imagine somebody's going to have some questions about the VE list, but let me make sure everybody's clear what we're doing. We, we, we have the funding available to let the contract, but what we have to do is use furniture or technology or something else. So we, we, the total budget is short. We're working on the VE number to close the gap, but we know that we're going to go back. We have funding to go back. The commissioners have been told the county manager has been told he is aware that we've got a VE list that we're working on in fact that we sent him a copy of the list for information purposes so he would kind of have a general idea of what 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 we're looking at so that being said um, we'll start with dr. Phillips do you have any questions or comments well j just as a reminder when when we met last month it looked like we were about a million dollars too high for the total project we were at like 20 point Five million, and we had, or we're hoping to have, 19.5. Um, so it looks like we've we've managed to cut out about 25 percent of that million dollar shortfall with the value engineering. Am I reading that right? Certainly, certainly the reductions did go uh, towards the the direction that we wanted it to go to. Well, go ahead. Um, one important point, and uh, you may be looking at the, the financial document on the bottom where you're looking at that $830,000 number, that short file. Um, there's a couple of notes at the bottom that I would call your attention to. Um, the amount, uh, the very bottom note, the amount that's needed does not represent the funds that will be necessary to complete the project. Um, no contingency has been provided for the, in this calculation. The purpose of tonight's meeting and the calculation provided is to award the bid so that the project can, can be completed timely. In addition, the Board of Education paid $95,000 of architect fees for this project from its fund balance in which we will request reimbursement. So there are several things that are not calculated in that number. That number only allows us to let the bid tonight. And that's assuming that you guys will not change the value engineering. You may pull some out. You may add, you know, you may do some things. This is just a starting number. So. And, and let me interject one quick thing. The total list was nine something. I mean, we told them, hey, here's what we want to get, and we got them. So there was 600 items that, as a committee, we decided those were things we did not want you know, less, less of a specification on the roof or a shorter time frame on the roof was one. I can't remember, you know, but there were, there were items on there that we said, no, we won't accept. You know, that, that's what the, the contractor gives you a list and you accept some and you reject some. So these were the, this is the list of items that we thought were, we wanted to recommend as for acceptance on our part um, to reduce the amount. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, I, I mean, I don't have any objection at all to to the items on the list. They look like they were fairly cosmetic for the most part. Um, but what, what the concern I have is is making a commitment to build a building when we don't have all the money. But I, I guess in a, in a worst case scenario, if the uh, county commissioners present company accepted uh, or exempted tell us to go pound sand when we asked them for $830,000 more after already asking for $2 million more, I guess we found out in our first presentation this evening that we do have a fund balance that would cover that if, if 
you know, we can't get the money anywhere else. Am I? I know you don't want to say that's what we're going to do, but I don't want to. I don't want to write a check that I can't cash. So certainly, if if we are if we find ourselves in that position, the first thing we'll do is we'll meet and we'll discuss what the options are, and what the priorities are, and we'll go from there. But you're telling me it's not. This is not a um, hypothetical scenario that we might be short. We are short. That's correct for the construction budget. Yes, oh. yeah. and uh, we still and we still budget. don't know how much the state's going to ask us to have to put up for the um, highway 73 uh, intersection. Correct. That is still an unknown. Yes. So that that could be another check that we have to cash here in a minute. I'll interject some other point there. The commissioners are well aware that that may be a state requirement, and that. We, you know, we don't pay for that because we don't we don't get money. So they're fully aware that if that request comes, it's coming to them. It's not coming to us. Does that? I mean, only because they hold the money. We don't have it. So. Thank you. I'd like to address Dr. Phillips. Um, Dr. Phillips, our capital account fund balance is about three hundred thousand. If you'll recall the the financial presentation, that so that would be the dollars that we have that are available for a capital outlay um, expenditure, and that's what this is. The other dollars that we talked about, those are operating dollars, and that's the way those dollars are allocated and intended to be spent, and that's what we should spend those dollars for. Otherwise, spending them for other things or, or cheating our teachers, our staff, um, our, our students. And so those should not be spent on anything other than operating. It is the county's responsibility and obligation to fund our buildings, and we should not take no for an answer. Um, there are options, and so if the county tells us no, then I would expect to come back to this board and um, we can cut six classrooms out. Uh, that's not an option that we gave you for value engineering because we don't think that that's an option. But if the county tells us no, then we come and we cut six classrooms. And guess what? In two years, we're going to come back, we're going to double the cost, and we're going to ask them for the money again. No, sir. I'm not going to write a check that I can't cash, but I'm not going to spend operating money. I'm not going to recommend to you that we're going to spend operating money on a capital expenditure that's not, that's not our responsibility to do. Thank you, Kelly. Any other question, Mr. Harrison, Mr. Shue? I, I just wanted to comment. Uh, Ms. Clutch, you did an excellent job on your explanation there. I just wish more people understood that, you know, that we don't want to mix up our responsibilities. The capital money is for capital projects. Operating money that we have in our fund balance is in our general operating fund. Mm -hmm. And this money was derived from operating efficiencies. Nothing to do with the local money. This is state money through operating efficiencies and it should only be used for the operation of the school. Now I know that we did have to take money I'm not sure where we took the 95000 from to pay that's the architects. Capital. That was it came, capital. So it came from the capital. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, since that's a capital expense, we should ask you know, that be replaced back we to should. that. Because you, you think about it, you know, and Chuck, he's here. When he has a breakdown and it's something that's not on the, his list, then he has to have a pool of money to pull from to fix things. And so you can't deplete your capital reserves there to zero. And then when something happens, you have to leave it broke until you get a funding source, which is the commission. Right. And you can't wait 30 days till they have their meeting to ask for more money. You have to do it right then. And at, at that time, you have a choice. Let it stay broke mm -hmm. and not fixed for 30 days, you know, or go to the commission in 30 days. So either way, you know, but you don't want to you don't want to cross mix your money though, Jeff. You got, that's that's uh, pretty much a, a standard rule. You can't you can't change the funds around like that. They have to go to what they're designated for. Uh, I do have one real quick question for you, Dave, on the uh, value engineering. Uh, when we're we're talking about uh, eighteen thousand reduction on the roof there going from a 60 millimeter PVC to 60 millimeter uh, TPO, 
What kind of a variance on the warranty are we talking about? Because you know the trouble that we have with these flat roofs anyway. Okay. Um, the roofs, the, these roofs will be low slope roofs. And so we have the, the TPO or the, um, uh, this is going to TPO. Um, the other roof is the uh, standing seam metal roof. Um, the, the warranties are the same uh, between the um, PVC and the TPO. So this is the difference between a metal roof? This is the difference between a PVC roof, which is a membrane roof, and a TPO roof, which is also a membrane roof. It's a dis just a different type of membrane. Okay, so we're not talking about changing from metal to something the else. The metal is still there. Okay, well that's good because I, I think that uh, obviously metal roofs cost more up front, and, but when you look 20 years from now, 25 years from now, I probably for surely probably won't be here, but somebody's going to say, well, you know, everybody uses metal roofs. They've been using them for the last 30 years. How come they didn't put these on the schools? And so we don't want that to come up for some other people's boards after us to have to be replacing roofs because we didn't do it right to start with. This board actually was very clear that they wanted uh, metal roofs yeah, and you know, I think on this that project. We, you know, so I think that, you know, as an ongoing uh, an, a suggestion for the boards, this board and ongoing boards, you know, is to continually try to pursue metal roofs because it only saves money down the road. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like this way to say, fi uh, fix it now or fix it later so we can fix it now by doing the right thing. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Shoe. Mr. Shoemaker, I'll, I'll come. Um, well, I appreciate this list, and I know that it was extensive as we went through it to try to allege, you know, assess our exposure on some of the items because some of the items really did expose us to lesser quality materials and would uh, reduce the building life from the 50 years that we we're probably going to get out of this building to something a little bit less. And then some components aren't quite that long. But there is still something that we're looking at on the side, and it is not included in this. And that, and when we talked with the commissioners in our mediation, we talked to them about the fact that we did have a pricing for for the thermo. Um, help me. Geothermal. geothermal. Yeah, thank you for the geothermal option and the LED option. And, and Dave is still pursuing that information now to see if we can find a profit. Um, public relationship that may be able to fund those options for us so we won't have to do them but at the same time Mike Downs and his team were were very engaged about that particular option because of, of the potential for saving money uh, down the road and we want to, to save as much money for the future taxpayers as we possibly can and this would be an uh, definitely an avenue to follow you know the ROI on this was uh, well, the NPV on this came back to about 12 to 14 years, but we could probably do better if we could get the private companies to invest with us where they could get the tax breaks and actually lessen the, the ROI to about six or seven years. So those are options. So that's still out there. We've got about 60 days beyond the approval of this contract before we have a drop-dead date where we can't execute that option. So. It is alive and well. We could be coming back to this board to say, look, we would like to do this option. Here's what we've got. And then this board would have to uh, buy off on it or not buy off on it. But So we do still have a little bit of time before that takes place. But I just wanted to keep that in front of you that we have not, with this, eliminated those options. So we still have LED lights and, uh, and the geothermal options available to us at least for 60 more days after we approve this contract. So. Thank you, Mr. Shoemaker. Ms. Carpenter? Oh, Y'all must have did some real changing around because first they had the payback at 30 years. No. No, I hadn't looked. But, uh, Barry's the one looking at the geothermal. No, no. no. Oh, so you're using a 30-year project life, but the ROI and the NPVs were coming back to around somewhere between 14 and 18 years, depending on what kind of interest rates you were using, what kind of inflation rates you were using. Well, they gave, gave a... Right. It said payback first thing, it said 30 years payback. Uh, but anyway, I'll get the information. One of the things I was, was curious about, did they, uh, on the, when they were doing this value engineering, did they show any of 
say, deleting some windows or anything like that because I know that a lot of times if I, I know you want to have windows to have your natural lighting and, and all this type thing, but two, there's a good and bad side to both things because, you know, you look at some of your schools now, I always think of Central. That's one of the perfect examples because I know all the caulking, all the things we've done, and you look at especially some of your older schools because for a while there, everybody were putting in, in windows so they could get the natural lighting and everything. But then when you go now to have to repair them, to caulk them and all this thing, uh, it, it, it's a disaster. Uh, but was that something we looked at to use less windows so we didn't have to pay that much? Was that one of the options we looked at? Sure. And one thing I want to make sure everybody understands, really the value engineering effort you know, really took place several months ago uh, before we went to bid. Um, what the, the effort that we've been going through now is really the, the, the reductions. Um, and to answer your question specifically, windows were not reducing the number of windows or eliminating windows was not, was not, uh, was not offered, was not priced. Um, and, and you hit the nail on the head, really. Uh, it's, um, there's several things. You know, the natural lighting is, is a good thing uh, that we are pursuing. It is something that we do strive for. Um, and and it is uh, also works into energy savings on lighting. So uh, it was to answer your question. No, it was not one of the items that was offered by the contractor. Do you have the list in front of you? The things that we did not accept. I do not. Uh, Carpenter, I, I thought maybe that would be beneficial if you heard at least a sample of some of those. If you had it, but go ahead. Yeah, that I was just curious because, like I say, it, it can be a double-edged sword because then. I mean, you got your natural lighting, but then too, you know, it, it can cause, you know, when after years, oh, thank you. then too, you've got the problem where, yeah, you get the natural lighting, but then after 10, 15 years, then you get the problem where then you're, you, you know, you can have energy loss because then you got to start caulking, you got to start doing the things and then when you get the problems like we have now where we know we're we're having the problems with maintenance that's when you start having the problems so that was that was one of my questions with that uh, thank you Ms. Carpenter Mr. Walter um, they you mentioned the value engineering prior to the, the bid help me to understand again um, we asked the county commissioners for 20 million, then it was 19 and a half, was what we thought it was going to be. And then we went ahead and we spent some additional architect money to save costs. And I think that's savings, I think we met something like $1.4 million. So where is, it, where is that savings um, in this process? Well, I, I think if you go back and you look at the, the uh, cost per square foot of uh, the facility, um, what we looked at and what we've seen from this project is that this is a very competitive cost per square foot for something that was bid in October of 2014. I think the, um, the, the budgeting figures are such that they are relying on a lower cost per square foot um, and that, that's, that, that time has, has come and gone and that's not the market today. So it's increased that much over the one year period for um, or six months. Yeah, what, uh, if you remember some of the information that we provided uh, at last month's uh, meeting, I think we were showing where uh, costs, this, this project came in at uh, um, the building plus the site uh, was $173 a square foot. And if you looked at the market, um, and if you translated that to, to today's dollars, um, it was in the neighborhood of, there was one at 227, one at 173, one at, actually that's not translated. So it was $236, $182, and $174 a square foot. Um, so that average price is, is much higher um, than the price that, that we have received on bid day. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Walter. Mr. Uh, Shu had one more comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dave, I'm not sure, you know, of all the items that was on there that you took off. I think you mentioned there was 900 items. Was it 900? Uh, 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 dollars. 900. 900 oh, okay, I see. All right. Well, uh, 
this will probably be my last opportunity to bring this up, and I wanted to bring it up because I, I don't know if this is incorporated in this plan or not, but the scenario is this. I have a parent that's got a disabled child, a physically disabled child. They're in a wheelchair. They pull up to the school. It's pouring down rain, and he's, he or she is with their child. And when t the time they get the wheelchair out, get the student out, you've probably heard this already. You know, do we have a way or a means to provide some type of a shelter for people that's got disabled children to pull up to so that they haven't got to get out of their car and stand in the rain, hold, try to hold an umbrella and get their child in, in, in the wheelchair and get them wheelchaired to, you know, wherever they got to go and then the same repeat process in the evening. You know, I, I see Janet's back there. I won't call on you to speak, Janet, but I'm sure you've probably got students in your school with that same scenario. And this particular parent that spoke with me, I think they're children that go to Patriot. And, you know, we really need to try to look out a little bit more, you know, for our students with disabilities. Because, you know, I mean, they're just as important as those that can get up and get out of the bus or get out of the car and walk in, obviously. And they're entitled to uh, the little extra measure, I think, to get them, you know, in the school without being soaking wet. And then the repeat process for the parent when they come back to put the wheelchair in. So is that incorporated or do you know some type of a, a drive-up shelter for the, those type of students? Yeah. So as far as canopies go, uh, we do have canopies uh, both in the front entrance, which is, would be the parent drop-off, and we have canopies at the bus parking lot uh, for the bus parking. Uh, we did not propose any reductions or cuts um, to the canopies. Uh, specific to a drive-through or drive-under canopy, the school doesn't have a drive-under canopy, um, but um, it's certainly something that we can look at. It seems to me like it needs to be, you know, obviously the canopy is there. It just needs to be extended a little bit further and in the front of the line or the back of the line where just for those particular students to be able to get out of their car. Yeah, and I, I would have to look at the design. Often we do try to cantilever uh, it out so that, but we also have to be very careful that we don't lose the canopy to a, you know, a track, you know, height that, you know, isn't paying attention and, and that will happen. Oh, I, and I um, could see that very easily happening, yeah, but... And, you know, this is an issue that I would like to see us, not only if it's not for this school, but at least look at it for this school, but some of the other schools, you know, that's got this issue. And obviously it's going to require funding. And then, of course, that's probably where I'm going to come in play at some point. But it's something, though, that I think that we need to try to do, though, if we can. And we're not talking about tens of millions of dollars it's not that much, you know, to do just a little bit more for those kids. It's a good just point. Just for whatever it's worth. I, I can tell you that at the, the same meeting where we went through the VE list, we also looked at the schematic design for Mount Pleasant Middle School and a canopy we talked about. And the canopy there is on the front and extends through the island out into the parking lot, so it does exactly what you're talking about doing. But the layout is conducive to that. So, I mean, we did... You know, I'll give Dave the credit. He's the one that brought it up talking about it. Um, but we did, that was something we did talk about. So, okay. Um, real quick, I wanted to point out that uh, Chuck was in our meeting. So from a maintenance standpoint, we weren't just ripping off items of things that, that he's going to have to deal with. He was in agreement for items that we said, well, we will decline that because that might be a maintenance problem, or we'll accept that because, hey, the savings is worth it and it won't be, create a burden down the road. So just, just uh, so you guys know, he was involved with that, uh, that discussion. So, yeah. All right. Um, everybody okay with consent? Not ahead? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Well, we will move forward with that next week and now we're going to move on to 4.04 .04. and board members I don't if you have something to say you certainly can this is basically a legal agreement because we're going to build a school on property that we don't own so that 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 that's the bottom line there's not a real there's not a whole lot really to talk about Sarah has nothing really to add other than the document speaks for itself so uh, unless somebody really has something they want to say about it can I get a nod of the heads for consent all right. 
property we don't own. Well, doing? we're acting as the agent for the county because the county owns the property and we're going to build the building. Oh, and, on that property? Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then when it's all finished, the county get the deed back. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But it's on the existing property, right? Yes. Oh, yep. Okay, we'll move on. 4.05, uh, NCSB board member Rob Walter, or excuse me, to, to, to have training hours submitted to the NCSB, NCSBA for Rob. Rob took an ADA course. Do you want to tell a little bit about it? That's a free course online that I would recommend you all taking if you want a little background on the ADA laws. It was uh, pretty helpful to get an over, overview. It's not, I mean, it covers a lot of different things. Okay, Rob requested that we submit it for uh, board training, and I told him I thought that was a good idea. Everybody okay for consent? Yep. All right, good deal. Well, Rob, that was uh, sounds like a good class, so I'm glad you did that. And we will move on to Section 5. This is a little unusual. We don't typically have an action item at a work session, but this came up previously. There's a timing uh, issue involved with, with Kelly, so we need to, uh, they've asked us to take action on it, and we'll welcome Glenda to the podium, and she can present it to us. All right, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to set the stage for this presentation by saying that all of our employees are valuable to the district, and it's our goal to continue advocating for each group to receive additional compensation. With that said, Tonight, we are attempting to decrease a gap in administrator pay in order to increase retention of effective principals. Maya Angelo shared this thought. You can only become truly accomplished at something you love. Don't make money your goal. Instead, pursue the things that you love, the things that you love doing, and then do them so well that people can't take their eyes off of you. Obviously, educators across North Carolina have adhered to this suggestion by Angelo because they have continued in a profession for love and not money. Cabarrus County Schools is fortunate to have a group of administrators who love education and perform at a level that makes them very marketable across the state. Tonight, we have a representative group that made up our committee for this proposal tonight, and I would like to recognize those that are in the audience and just ask them to stand. We have Adam Arbach, who is our principal at Wolf Meadow. We have Hilda Batts, who is our principal at A.T. Allen. Michelle Klein, our principal at Hickory Ridge High School. Brian Hamilton is AP at Irvin Elementary. Mike Jolly is principal at Northwest Cabarrus High School. Mary Beth Roth, Winkler, she is at Winkler Middle School as principal. Janet Smith is principal at Weddington Elementary School. Sandy Valentine, AP at Concord High School. Dr. Jason Van Heuklem is our deputy superintendent and, and assisted with this committee, as well as myself and our chief finance officer. So at this time, I am going to ask Kelly Klutz as our chief finance officer to take a few moments to highlight some of the funding information, and then we're going to have Adam Arbach and Michelle Klein come up and do a presentation and share some additional information with you all uh, from our committee's perspective, and then Kelly and I will come back for questions, okay? Okay. So I know sometimes it's hard for us to listen when we have questions in our head. So there's three things that I want to tell you prior to the presentation because I want you to listen to their presentation. So three points. One is the funding um, for this. I want to talk to you about the funding that's, um, that we're going to use for this or we're going to propose to use for this. So um, the state um, does a projection of our ADM. Um, and they do that early back in February, March, and they projected our ADM, our average daily membership, at 30,519 students. And now, at the second month, or not now, but at the second month of school, we had over 200 students more than that projection. So what that does is that gives us funding for those 200 students. So when we planned our budget, we plan with the projected number, the 30,519 students. So we plan on that number of students, and we plan on the, that, the dollars that are associated with those students. So now I'm expecting an adjustment for those additional 200 students from the state. We have our classroom settled. Our class sizes are adequate. They're suitable. And we don't anticipate changing those levels at this moment. So the state will give me at least eight, eight teaching positions with this increase. 
they'll give me those positions in a dollar a, a teaching a position allotment. So I will take eight of the, if the board agrees to do this, I will take eight of my locally paid teachers. I will move them to state paid position allotments. That will free up about $400,000 of my locally paid, my local money. And that will allow me to have a reoccurring uh, revenue stream or, or expense to be able to pay for this. So I want to put your mind at ease that we can pay for this and we can pay for this beyond one year. Okay, so that's the first thing that I want you to know. The second thing is that we, we see this as a dire need. We feel like we need to stop this, this uh, wound from bleeding. But we, we recognize that we have other issues, that this, this is not just a principal issue, this is a system issue. We've brought it to the board, we've brought it to the commissioners, and we're not planning to stop bringing it. I want you to know that in 1213, fiscal year 1213, in our bu budget proposal, we asked the commissioners for $2 million. To, and part of that was to do the salary increase, salary study. In 1314, we asked for $4 million to support the salary study. This is teachers and principals and, and all of our staff. In January 2014, we issued a resolution, and we went straight to the board, and we asked for this money again. That's the third time. And believe it or not, the third time we got a little bit of money. So maybe the third time's the charm. In 2014-15, in our budget request, we asked for it again, another $2 million. And I assure you, we will ask for it again and again and again. We plan to fight for our teachers and our other staff. We're trying to stop the bleeding right now with this. That's all we're, we're doing, okay? We haven't forgotten teachers. We haven't forgotten other staff. We're just trying to, to stop the wound right now, okay? That's two. The third thing that I want to tell you is that our teachers um, at the state level got a pay increase on average it was across the board average, different for a level zero teacher, different for a 30-year teacher, but on average, it was a 7% pay increase, okay? You remember hearing those numbers. Our principals and our assistant principals, on average, got a 0.78% pay increase, okay? What we're going to ask you tonight is going to equate to a 4.29% pay increase for our principals. Add those two numbers together, you're going to get about a 5% pay increase. Now, it's still less than what teachers will have received in this fiscal year. We're not suggesting that teachers are more valuable than principals. They're all valuable to us. Again, we're just trying to stop the bleeding, okay? All right, so that's... That's my three points, so I hope that we freed your mind of some things and you can listen to our principals and hear their, their points with the presentation. Fantastic. Thank you, Kelly. Now we will welcome uh, Adam and Michelle to our podium, and thank you for being here. Mr. Chair, while they're getting all ready, I wanted to add just a little bit to uh, Ms. Klutz's presentation there. When she refers to, just so that everybody will know and the viewing audience will know, when she says stop the bleeding, we don't have people physically out here bleeding. <laughs> what we're talking about is that people at certain times in their life decide they want to move to a different school district to somewhere else. And that's what we're talking about because we have lost hundreds and hundreds of people over the last few years. And in more recently, we've lost uh, principals and assistant principals. And so when she says stop the bleeding, that's what we're referring to. We're trying to um, bring our people up. We're still not where we need to be. Even with this increase, I think it's probably, I think when we talk today, it's one-third of what it needed to be, you know, to get us in a competitive situation. But anyway, um, when we say stop the bleeding, we're trying to get people to stay with Cabarrus County Schools and commit to Cabarrus County Schools with their finishing their career here and because it costs to retain people, it costs to train people, and whenever you lose those people, 
then somebody, some other district benefits from what we've done, and then we've got to start all over again. So this is a way that we um, are, that the system is proposing that the board look at this and, and provide this increase. So I'm, that's all I got. You can go ahead, Adam. I don't think we have anything. <clears throat> all right, you said it all. I'll Thanks say, so I think you're good. <laughs> Down. So um, we're here tonight to talk from the principal's perspective too and talk about what the committee discussed. Um, our strategic plan says that, in or that we want to be a top 10 school district and um, we're here to, to make the case that to be a top 10 district in the state and in the, in the nation, leadership matters and the leadership at the school. Um, like Kelly said, the current um, state compensation structure doesn't, doesn't really get everything done that, that needs to be done. Um, we, we already mentioned that some of the principals have already left, so this is from the Independent Tribune that, um, this summer. The two of Cabarrus County's top principals um, left for CMS, um, making between twenty-seven and twenty-four thousand dollars more a year um, to go down there. Um, in order to retain and recruit the high-quality administrators that we need at the schools um, and keep them from going to other districts, um, we need to increase the salaries for all the administrators in the county. Um, this money can be life-changing for some people and their families. You know, twenty-four, twenty-seven thousand dollars a year can change a lot, um, and they don't have to significantly move. They can still stay um, in their current houses, stay here, and just commute there. So um, we need to think about that um, for our current administrators. Um, um, in uh, if you, here's a chart that shows in the calendar years. Uh, 2000, there was a chart. Uh, there, it two, there it is. 2012, we lost seven system principals and one principal. 2013, seven and one. In 2014, just during the calendar year, nine assistant principals and six principals have left, um, and there's still two months left in the year. Um, four of those principals and three of those assistant principals left for um, Charlotte Mech there as well. Um, in order to retain the high quality teachers that we need, we need the high quality administrators in the school. Research shows that the number one reason that teachers stay um, in the profession or leave the profession is administrative support in their schools and in, in, in what they're doing there. Um, this could get even worse because as Charlotte, um, Charlotte Mecklenburg um, is looking at a quarter cent sales tax referendum where the money will go straight to salaries to add to CMS. So the gap could get even larger. Um, that's $28 million that the school board chair said is going to go into salaries there. Right now, the average principal supplement in Cabarrus County is about 30% of what it would be in Charlotte Mech, and the average assistant principal supplement is about 20% of what it would be in Charlotte Mech right now. And I'm going to talk to you about just some other things that research indicates about, about the role of the principal. And I know most of you are familiar with this. I mean, you've, you've seen us at meetings and you've seen us um, at, at different things. But the main thing is the role of the principal has certainly changed over the, the past years. Um, we are no longer just the manager of a school. Um, you know, as you all said before, it's the principal's role to be notifying parents of what is going on. All the things that you were talking about, about the roof and the caulking, that's my job to know about those things too, things I never thought I would have to learn about. But there are so many hats and so many things that we have to know about um, that we really are the CEO of the most important company that there is because we are charged with, with our children. I mean, that's the most important thing that there is. Um, our schools are also not just something we manage, we are charged with having vision statements and mission statements and things that we live and breathe and strategic plans um, that are aligned with our strategic goals for the county. And the reason that Cabarrus County is so great is because we do those things and our principals believe those things and they make those workable, viable documents. And that's one of the reasons I'm so proud to be a part of them. Um, principals impact their students. I'm not thinking back. Principals impact their students' outcomes, particularly at the most challenging schools. Um, and certainly, as, as Adam mentioned, I know it's something that every interview that I have with a teacher, and I've had lots of those um, in, in the last few months, I'm trying to hire teachers, but I always say to them, the last question is, what do you need from your administrators? And the number one answer that they always say is, I need support. And so I say to them, please tell me what that means to you. And the answer is always very different, but it does show you the important role that, that we really play um, to them. Um, principal turnover adversely impacts schools, and Mr. Shu, I think, said it very clearly that any time we spend time sort of growing and coaching and cultivating people with, with the ideas of Cabarrus County and the ideas of our schools and we lose those people, the whole process has to start over again. Um, and the same thing that when I go into a school with, with my vision and my vision and my mission and I get my school to buy into that and I leave, the whole process starts over again. Um, and that, that's sometimes very difficult to deal with. Effective principals retain and recruit effective teachers. Um, 
Adam and I work, Adam, Adam and I work with our new teacher leader group, and we do um, a session with them called Monday Morning Leadership. Familiar with that book? Monday Morning Leadership? Well, one of the eight lessons in that book that we really harp upon with our, our teachers is the idea of hire smart. And we believe that as principals, that is the most important thing that we do, that we hire the best people to get in there to do the work that matters every day, which is to work and teach our students. And so if we do that, um, then that is, that's the most important thing we can do. Um, we become more effective as we gain experience, so we might like to think we're pretty good. Um, you know, you're principal of the year and everything, but we're, we're rookies. But if you look at, you know, Janet and Hilda and Mary Beth, they can show you what we might aspire to be um, someday if we continue with this. And being an instructional leader is the hallmark of effective principals. And it wasn't that way 15 years ago. Um, I just don't think that was the case. But I think it's definitely what it is now. And we have leadership from the top um, in Cabarrus County School that's telling us the rigor and the relationships and the guaranteed curriculum that we want to do. But those things are not going to happen in our schools unless we are there to monitor them and to make sure that they're happening. Um, some other responsibilities that we have, we are responsible for student engagement, achievement, and growth from pre-K to early college. That is essentially our business, if you want to think about it that way, that we aren't selling cars, we are growing students, and that's the number one thing that we're supposed to do. Um, fiscal responsibility for our schools and, you know, the ADM budgets that we have, Adam probably has one of the smaller budgets um, in the school system, and I probably have one of the largest because you have how many students? 603. And I have almost 1,603. So, you know, when you look at that, we have a very big, big difference. Um, we oversee a variety of extracurricular activities, athletics, clubs, performance, competitions, students going all over the place doing, doing wonderful things that we want to encourage them to do. Managing our school facilities. You know, we have not only school buildings, but we have all kinds of athletic fields and just gyms and things like that that we, we have to be responsible for. Um, again, recruiting and retaining a highly qualified staff. And the other thing is that we're often put in positions to have to hire faculty that really could make a lot more money doing something else. Um, for example, I know I'm right now um, have to hire a health occupations teacher. Well, in order to get this position, you have to have been a nurse for three years. So one of the jobs I have to do is I have to explain to someone who works as a registered nurse, making far more money than I can pay them, why they want to come and work at my school and why they want to come and work with me. Okay, so that makes a very, um, a very, very tenuous thing for me to do sometimes. We also main, we form and maintain relationships with complex fundraising organizations. Um, we develop and implement innovative programs, academies, magnet programs, pilots. We were having some discussion about that. All these things that are evolving and have been evolving over the last few years in Cabarrus County, really exciting things um, that, that are going on. Um, and we, we manage student discipline every day. Um, and sometimes those things are pretty easy and sometimes they aren't. Sometimes they lead to, you know, criminal situations and um, legal investigations and going to court and those kind of things. Um, we evaluate and monitor staff. And again, most important thing we do is to coach our staff. Um, we, we hope we've always hired the right people, but if, if case there's not something just right, that's our responsibility to make them better. Okay, that's what we're supposed to do. Um, Schools are often recognized as a symbol of the community, and, and we as the principals are often seen as the face and the voice. I know I was actually two weeks ago um, at the Harrisburg Town Council um, work session, um, you know, talking about some things in our community. So it's important. Um, we're important for this. Um, we make decisions. Um, to make sure that we implement local, state, and federal mandates. And just as you all saw with all your policy updates, that's not easy to keep up with sometimes. So luckily we have good people to, to keep us informed of that. We are constantly looking for ways to keep kids in school to increase our graduation rate. And that's the reason that North Carolina has increased over the years and that Cabarrus County um, is frankly just, just really getting off the charts with that, thank goodness. And we are responsible for student supervision and safety. And we always have been, and that's always gonna be our number one goal. But I think you would agree that with our society the way that it is, with unfortunately lots of episodes of school violence and with social media th and things the way it is, just making things a lot more rampant, that's become an increasingly more challenging task for us. And unfortunately, while all these responsibilities have increased, our pay really has not. Um, so a comparison of the teacher and principal salary shows that the vast majority of assistant principals and principals at the same experience level would have very little variance in their salary. And I can tell you for um, experience that I taught high school English for 13 years and I was a teacher with a master's degree in a national board. And 
when I became an assistant principal, if I had not fallen into that little clause that I got to keep my national board pay, I would have lost money to become an assistant principal. So I was very fortunate that that was something that worked in my favor because although I, I really enjoyed my experience as an English teacher, I thought this is my calling and this is the passion and this is where I'm meant to be. So I hate to think that we have other people that are going to miss out on that for those reasons. And I only had a master's degree. I wasn't nationally board certified, but it was a $40 a month raise to become an assistant principal for, to go from a teacher. So not even enough to buy lunch in the cafeteria each day um, difference. That's why they're having that yeah. problem in the cafeteria. Yeah, yeah that's exactly it right there. And I like to eat. So. Um, and in, or, in order to attract and retain our effective principals and assistant principals, like our principal of the year, um, we have to do adequate compensation and supplements must be increased um, to be competitive. That's wonderful fruit basket, too. Um, so what this, this chart here that we're going to talk about is actually, if you think about it, a way a cost savings. And, you know, uh, Mr. Shu mentioned it, that the cost that goes into training new staff, there's a lot of um, hidden costs there. So anytime you hire a new person, you've got to go through recruiting or, and doing those things or um, training them or, or the lost productivity of mentors having to work with them and things like so, technology. Um, so it's important that we, that we think about this as the money up front is going to be saving money because every time we hire a new principal, there's more training and things that need to go into that. So when, we, when the committee met, we talked about a lot of different factors to try and um, come up with a, a fair and, and a, a good start to address the issue of supplements. Currently, the supplement is based just on your um, a base pay, just on your years and level that you work on. So what the committee came up with was, a th was three different parts to the new proposal here. There's the base pay, uh, percentage based on um, what level you're at, in principal, middle principal, um, and at what level you're at, assistant principal. Um, there's also a loyalty um, section there. So the longer you're with Cabarrus County Schools, whether it's as a teacher or an administrator, the, the cup, two more percent for every five years there as well. And then there's an at-risk factor um, percentage there too because um, schools with a, a lower at-risk um, population compared to a school with a higher at-risk population, there are some different challenges and um, duties that come along with that there. So the committee met, we, we talked through these and, and felt that this um, is, all three of these areas are all cut and dry and they're very easy to put somebody on one of these levels and figure out where they are. There's nothing um, subjective, nothing um, that could be cloudy or become an issue. It's very easy to know how long you've been here, what type of school you're at, and what level you're at. Um, and that this plan is not um, perfect, doesn't fix everything, doesn't completely close the gap to the Charlottes and the other areas here, but it's a, it's a great first step and it puts us on the right track to um, getting where we need to be. Also, it's a relatively small amount of money compared to the total budgets and some of the big numbers that we talk about that you guys especially talk about here. Um, it's a relatively small um, dollar amount, but it can have a huge impact on staff, on morale, and ultimately the students because the, the, we keep the better principals and the better administrators working to recruit and get better and better teachers. It's going to have great effects for our students here. Um, so, Kelly, do you want to talk more about the number part? Or? There's one thing in particular I wanted to reiterate. Um, you've heard of just-in-time inventory. I have just-in-time supporting data. Okay, is that is that good? Um, thanks to Hilda Batts sitting in the background, she uh, sent me an email, and the the headlines um, reads: "Replacing a principal can cost district 75k." And I'll give you, I'll send you this email. Um, if you guys want, but about half of our new principals leave in their third year of school at, at a school, according to a recent report of the School Leaders Network. The group says that high turnover rate comes with a cost about $75,000 to recruit and train each replacement, and then there's an article. So I'll forward you that. Thank you, Ms. Batts. Um, but uh, so we, we tried to give you, um, you know, I talked uh, earlier in general about the overarching it's a you know four percent four and a half percent um, pay increase overall based on their salary if you look at the supplement we look at it different um, and then I, I broke it down by level um, principles and AP so we can look at it a lot of different ways and so with this slide we're looking at supplement so the way that the percentage of salary to supplement before the, the increase and then the percentage to salary after the increase. So what, we're, what you're seeing is that it would take 
37,000 approximately of funds would go into, the, into our high school principals. Their average um, supplement would move from 26% of their state salary to 32% on an average, okay? Same way, just going down the chart, um, you can see um, probably one of the, the biggest areas of increase would be our elementary school principals, um, you know, about an 8% increase. Um, but they average out in the end to be about that 4, 4.2 or so um, increase. But you can see exactly where, where the money hits and how many, and what's important too is how many people we're affecting. So there's $119,000 that it's going to cost us for to hit all of the elementary principals and get them in that schedule, but we're hitting 22. There's 22 staff members that we're affecting. So that's, you know, part of why the number's a little bit more. Uh oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do all that. Um, so I want you to look at it one other way, um, and then I'll take questions on, on those. Um, and this document shows percentage of salaries, because sometimes the numbers are, are really big. When you go from 26% of somebody's salary to 36% or whatever that number was, that they look like really big numbers. Um, but now we're just looking at, if you look at the percentage of increase over their total salary, and that's what we're, we're used to, to talking about in general, and the public is used to seeing that kind of thing, not just supplement or state salary or local salary. So that's why we gave it to you in this, this presentation. Um, so for high school principals, it would be a 4.72 pay increase on their salary. Um, middle school would be an average of 7.03 and just, just down the line, 7.43 for elementary principals. So those are the, the um, average, these are average percent. So one elementary principal might be, you know, a little less, one elementary principal might be a little bit more, but the average is that number, okay? So questions about that. Now the, the number down here, I'm not sure how to, let's see, let me see if I can get this. This number, 316608, does not have FICA and retirement in it. So the number that I gave you earlier, the 388, includes FICA and retirement. Okay? So be it. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you, Adam and Michelle. We appreciate that. Dr. Shepard had a comment he wanted to make. This will make sense in a few seconds. And David, you'll follow me on this because this is like you're kind of thinking. But... All right. It is a compliment. We're, we're, we're all now nervous. That's right. No, no, don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. Okay. Um, when Tammy Wynette used to sing Stand By Your Man, it had one message. Okay. When Lyle Lovett sang it, it had a totally different meaning. Our principals did not come to us tonight or four months ago or whenever this process started to say, we want more money or we will. This is a process that's driven from the fact that this, that I know as our leader, that if we don't pay our principals more, we're going to lose them. And I'm tired of losing them. So I want you to give this serious consideration so we can keep good people like the ones that are sitting in our audience and the many more that they represent. Because they're hardworking and they're deserving and this is one of my highest priorities as their leader, is to make sure that they're well compensated. So this is, I'm asking you to, ooh, this is good, I'm asking you to stand by our principles now, all right? Thank you, Dr. Shepard. That was pretty good. Good comments. And um, we'll start with any, everybody sat down, they ran from the podium, but if you have a question, certainly feel free. But uh, Mr. Walter, we'll start with you. Do you have a question? Actually, before we do that, you got to get another heads for consent. <laughs> we just bypass that all together. Oh. oh, that's right. We got to do it tonight. Sorry, we got to do even better than that. Go ahead, Rob. I'm Do you remember? I guess a salary study that was done what three years ago. What did it say about the the underpayment of our administrators? I'm glad you asked. Because I just happen to have that that data. Number four. Okay. Yeah. Let me do this. So the salary study is, is at least three years old now, probably a little bit older. Um, and so the salary study said that, 
at this time, the average um, principal and assistant principal, and they combined them at the time, they didn't break them out, um, supplement was $8,250 at the time. They said that for the average uh, responding districts, and those were districts that, that we decided that were, that were similar to us in size and, and, um, and, other, er and other things, should have been 11, it is $11,572, okay? So that was, and that's not been adjusted, and we need, need to do a new salary study. So this, on average, will increase each principal, assistant principal, put them all in the same bucket, $1,197. That means we still have $2,125 to go to get to what a three-year-old salary study said. So we're a, we'll be, if you approve this, a third of the way to a three-year-old salary study. And then all that time, Charlotte or somebody else is up, upping theirs as well. Exactly. That's why we need to continue our salary study. And tomorrow with their quarter cent sales yeah, tax. Yeah, exactly. Hope it doesn't. Never mind. <laughs> um, let's see. The one thing that just jumps out at me is this differential for the the elementary school and a high school principal, um, why is it so different? I mean, doesn't Adam have, I mean, his amount of time he spends is, would, would be just as, I mean, I guess it's a bigger, is it all based on the amount of students or what is it based on? Well, that's one of the things that we really talked about as a committee, and um, when we looked at the amount of time, not the number of students, but the amount of time, the responsibilities, the number of hours, and while all of these folks work tremendously um, hard, and they do a great job every day, the most difficult job that we have is recruiting high school principals because of that reason. Um, it, you know, it, we have a, it, while we have a difficult time recruiting principals overall, when you start looking for a high school principal, and we had to do that, unfortunately, this past summer, um, that's a much more difficult position to fill. So as, as the committee looked at that, and we had, a, uh, we had those variables in place already, um, we've, all, we've had that, and, and, and I think if you look across the state, you're going to find that. You're going to find because of the difficulty of recruiting, you've got the elementary, the middle, and the high, yeah, gonna, and there's a scale there. share that with me, though. Okay. Uh, that makes, I guess it makes, makes sense. It's a... Um, the other thing I didn't see, we don't have anything regarding school performance. Does that, we, we talk about at risk, Good question. do we Good address question. anything about school performance? Isn't it? That's another area that we did spend a lot of time discussing. And um, one of the things that, uh, one of the issues with the data this year at the state level has been the validity of how to assign that. Uh, to the teachers for effectiveness and how to assign that to the principals for effectiveness with their standards six and eight. So this, we want to move towards performance. And, and so this is a starting place for us. It's a foundation where we can start, as someone said earlier, to close that gap. But ultimately, we want to make sure that everything that we have when it becomes a performance-related bonus or supplement, that everything's valid there and there's not anything that could be perceived as arbitrary. Okay. I know we celebrate the good, good performance at some of these schools, right. but if there should be some financial benefit to that too, if they put up, put forth the effort. Um, overall, I, I I agree. I mean, the, the amount of work that you guys do and put in, I, I commend you and I, I appreciate you. And if this is a small way to, to help, I mean, there's probably more than just salary, salary that we could probably do, but this is a start, I think. So I'm I'm supportive of it. Thank you, Mr. Walter, Ms. Carpenter. Uh, well, I've got a couple questions. You know, I always do. Uh, you know, I want to. I know Dr. Shepard's down there saying, "Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'm going to rally for the top." Well, I work from the bottom up, uh, and I want to rally for them uh, because I, I'm still thinking about the teachers and the the clerical. And one of my first questions is, have we got any salary for the ones that were at the lower level? and had not gotten up to where they need to be because I know that was one of our first things when we were looking at the salary study. We had the non-certified non that were not even up to the minimum. Did we get money for that to start with? So, uh, Ms. Carpenter, we did the same thing for those staff members that were we're asking the board to do here is we actually raised um, 
put that took that out of our fund balance to raise them to a, a minimum level and we did that um, you, you took board on that board action on that um, gosh that was you know I'd have to pull that but that we was, did we, we did, got you, them there the board now. did do did take action on that we pulled them up to a minimum level so yes you did you did take care of some of our lowest very lowest paid so we got staff. them to minimum now right we, we're, we're not all yes to the minimum of the the salary range yes now are we at the midpoint no we we have a lot of work to do but 85 percent of your non-exempt staff are not at the midpoint okay now the other question that i have and where i'm kind of getting a little heartburn we are not offering the loyalty service to anybody else. The only people we're going to be offering this to now would be just our APs and our principals. Is that correct? And that's what's kind of giving me a little heartburn. I could do possibly the at-risk population and maybe the base to start with. Because, again, I've seen these guys at work. I've been there in the school, and I know what you do, guys. I really do. And I know we've got to do something. But, two, I'm a realist. I know we can't. We're not a Mecklenburg, guys. I know we're not. And, and I can't blame you if you want to go fight the traffic and fight with the other guy. I mean, I can't blame you. Uh, but, uh, listen, but we can't be a Mecklenburg. We're never going to be that and i mean to do that with that the salaries and everything we've got to compare apples to apples i mean we do we got to be realistic about it i mean the size and everything like that and we can keep chasing the dog's tail all we want to but i don't know if we're ever going to catch that tail uh i mean really we i mean it, we can keep trying trying and trying but we've got to compare the, the, the districts that we can be realistic with. Uh, but with that, I, it, it would really bother me if we are going to do that. We have got to be realistic and do it to, I would say, if we're going to give something like that, we need to be able to give it to our other employees. I mean, and I would feel more comfortable. I could give the other things. Mm -hmm. Uh, like say, because the at risk, do you know how many other, I know that we do have some that are given that at risk. Do you know how many other districts are given the at risk? No, ma'am, but I, one of the things that, you know, while we would love to be able to do this for all of our employees and, and realize that this is a starting point with our administrators, but one of the things with that loyalty part of that uh, was really to encourage that retention here in Cabarrus County Schools and to reward those principals who have remained faithful to us and let them know that, you know, one of the things about Cabarrus County Schools that um, impresses me most as a person coming in is the fact that we're always leading the pack. We're not the ones that are following. You know, we look at new ways and new opportunities to, whether it's from a curriculum standpoint or whether it's from um, a recruitment and retention packet for our administrators. So that's one of the things when we looked at what, you know, what are some opportunities for us to close that gap a little bit and can we look at what normal, what, it, what everyone else out there is doing and they're doing a base supplement, what some of those folks are doing, they're doing at risk. And when we looked outside of that box a little bit more and looked nationally, some of the national places, what those school districts were doing is they were looking at loyalty you know, within that district, a little bit uh, along the lines of what you do as a CEO with a company, you know, giving them a bonus or something to reward them for that loyalty. And I think that's why this committee ended up putting those three factors in there or those three variables because we've had a base supplement, which is not enough but we've done everything we could do. So what can we do to address it from an at-risk standpoint? Keeping in mind, even with the loyalty, not everyone will get the highest percentage there, but it rewards your service to Cabarrus County Schools, not as a state employee, but your faithfulness here. So that's one of the reasons the committee just you know put that in there. We want to lead the pack. We want to encourage the rest of the state to look at that when they're looking at a local supplement. Well, and that's, that's good. But then, too, we've had well over 200 and something teachers leave. That's right. And that's why I, I, we've got to start somewhere. 
and that that would be a compromise to do that and two I really think we need to make sure because there has been you know everybody's been through some rough times and I would rather look at something where we can help our teachers too and and to help help some of our other individuals and this is just just a thought and like I say I could I feel comfortable maybe with the other two parts to get started with something and that's just my two cents worth. Carolyn, let me just add a couple notes um, it would be my intention, and, and this is not something I've discussed with Dr. Shepard or anyone else at this point, but we have um, dollars that we've asked for on the salary study uh, every year, and, and we will ask for them again on uh, this year's budget request. But um, I plan to, to work with the committee and, and, and with Glenda. The idea is to mirror this supplement schedule for teachers so once we get something in place for principals that we like and eventually the idea would be also to to build a, a, a performance with a, an EVOS component in it and then it would we would mirror the exact same thing so that the way that principals are rewarded is the way that teachers are rewarded and that's that's the the long-range plan we're not going into this blindfolded um, but that can't happen overnight we have to start small do it right, and that a Colleen saying um, <laughs> quote, and we to to do this kind of thing for our teachers would cost me over six million dollars, and and I just just don't have that, can't create that, can't grow it on trees, but if we can structure this one structure the the supplement schedule for teachers, know what it's going to cost us put a plan in place, present it to the commissioners, present it to the committee, and get everybody on board, then that's something that we can work on. We can do step one, step two, step three. This is step half, one half. You know, this is before the game starts. And if we can't get this rolling, I don't know how we can get anything for teachers going. Because the idea is to mirror it. And if we don't have anything to mirror, what, what are we going to do for teachers? Thank you, Kelly. Thanks. Um, thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Mr. Shoemaker. Well, thank you for your hard work at clarification. And uh, I know we talked earlier today and appreciate the output of that conversation because this makes it a lot more understandable for myself and probably for a lot of the other people that are watching this. Um, having spent 30 some years of my working life in management, and unfortunately, you guys are going to resent me calling you managers, but you are. You are on the factory floor, i.e. the school, and you have a lot of little workers who are trying to do their work and make the most of themselves, and then you have people who are trying to supervise those folks. And usually, you're what I would call the higher level of a middle management position, and that you get hit from both ends. You get hit from the central side and you get hit from the lower side. And you're right in the middle and you just catch it from both sides. And usually as a result of that, you have to be on your game all day long and probably into the night because all day, there's nothing but interruptions in your day. And then you've got to have some quiet time to do what you're really supposed to do, which is vision your organization and try to move it forward. Guess what? You can't do that when the kids are in school. So you have to spend the quiet time when they're not there doing that, which means you're not it with your families, you're doing that work at your computer or whatever you're trying to do to build those relationships and build that vision for your team, and you have to do that on your time or some kind of time. But guess what? There's no margin for the family. There's very little margin for sleep because the family wants whatever sleeping time that you really want. So you, so you end up burning the candle at both ends, and that's your life every day. Go in there and you, try, you have to go in there inspired. Our principals are doing that. Our APs are doing that. We're training our APs to be like our principals, and we want them to give everything they possibly can. And out of 168 hours a week, they might get 42 hours of sleep, if they're lucky. So the rest of the week is dedicated either to some kind of family time, but I would say somewhere between 55 to 75 hours of that 168 is doing work for the school system, for our children, and giving up their lives for that. 1% raise since 2009, and that was because we begged for it in January of last year. After 
three times after two other times before that, maybe even more before I got on the board, but we begged for it and we finally got something. This year the state was so kind to give you a 0.7% raise, $500. By the time taxes are taken out, that comes out to about a $300 raise for the whole year. Um, thank goodness gas has gone down. <laughs> so you can't buy a little more gas now than what you used to be able to buy. We're now asking, and there, there is a standard deviation in there, and you can see that the, the, the pay increase goes anywhere from an average of 7.43% down to 26 So. It's, it's not equitable across the board in the way these are, but inside that you've got to understand there's probably some dynamics in the APs and the principals, and some of that dynamics is, are that some people have been here longer than others and that kind of thing, or there's a lot of very young people in the assistant principals that are getting to 2.23%, and so they're not getting some of that longevity pay, and they're in low-risk schools. So you, you look at all that. I think that on average a 4.29% plus the 0.7% that you presented to us, which is about a 5% raise, is fair and equitable based on what, what's going on. Now our teachers got a 7% raise on the average, and I have something that I want to talk about with that in just a moment, but that was an average and we know that not everybody's going to be compensated at all these levels. It is a really important that the public understand that we lost 15% of our APs and principals just in the space of July to now. 15% of our workforce. Now, that's your leadership workforce. In any factory, that would be crushing. And now we've had to raise new people up and try to get them filled in and trying to take over the team. That is a major demotivator for the people who are being led because their shepherds are gone and now they're out there trying to adapt to a new shepherd who's trying to learn their job at the same time. And I don't know if you know much about leadership, but leadership requires you to lead and people follow you, not to stand behind them and beat them up to, the, to, the, to where you want them to go. They gotta wanna follow you and, and it takes time to develop people who want to stand out in front and walk the path and the people follow them. And that's what we're talking about here. It takes time to develop people with those skills. They got to make a lot of mistakes. They got to mend a lot of fences because they're going to hurt people's feelings and they got to go back and say, I'm sorry, forgive me, stick with me, I'll learn as I go. And that's the kind of thing that our principals are having to learn. We lost 15% of those who have been tried and true. And for us not to, for us to turn our backs on these folks right now is a travesty. We've got to do something now. Now, let me move to the next thing. We've got to continue on with our commissioners. That salary survey is old now. It's three years old. And guess what? The expon exponential curve continues to move on. Districts continue to reward their people at higher and higher rates. We're behind. We've got to do another salary survey. Our teachers need to be rewarded. Um, our teachers got left out of longevity pay, and a lot of our veteran teachers are feeling the pain of that. And I'll guarantee you, what do our principals have to do? What do our APs have to do? They have to motivate the people who are so demotivated because of the way the salary increases were structured. So they got to go out there and whisper to their hearts and get them focused on why they're there and the esoteric portion of education. And that is the heartfelt transfer of knowledge from you to the children and get focused on that and nothing else. So again, I, I'm going to implore our commissioners, they've got to rise up. They've got to understand that the Cabarrus County taxpayer has gotten extremely great value, better value than they could have ever thought. One of the lowest per pupil compensated school districts in the entire state. We're putting out 89% of our kids are going and graduating from, college, from high school. $44 million was gotten here. We got in in um, scholarships for our kids. That's almost what the county gives us in money. So our kids almost brought in $44 million, which we used to, from the local. Our county commissioners got to find a way to get the public to understand that you cannot keep treating these people and expect our educational system not to go ahead and top out and to run off the parabola. We're at the top. We're almost at the weightless portion of our district right now. We've gone as high as we can go and if we don't start doing something, 
Weightlessness is going to cease, and we're going to get into gravity, and gravity is going to pull you down. And I want to keep going up. I want to see our district continue to go up. Our parents want our district. But there's a sacrifice that's going to have to be made, and our commissioners are going to have to get out there, get in front of this ship, and realize that you are doing the great value on the backs of our teachers and on our assistant principals. Today, we have the opportunity to deal with our assistant principals. In the past, we've talked to our commissioners. We presented budget after budget, and Kelly articulated that at the very beginning of this conversation. In mediation, we were pushing for raises. Guess what? We didn't get them. We got something, and we got what we could do with, but that's all we got, and we dealt with that. But now we're here again, and we've got a new group of commissioners coming in, and we're hoping we're going to get some different results. Our budget has been out there for everyone to see. Everyone knows that we asked for $2.63 million in raises this year, and we didn't get one penny. We tried, but we didn't get one penny. Our public needs to help our teachers, and it's going to take their voice and 180,000 people in this county to stand up and talk to Mr. Shu and say it is all right to help our teachers out. Find a way to do it. Find some creative way to help our teachers. So I am in support of this, and I will go down for that. Now, I want to close my portion with a, with a note that I received from a friend of mine today who's a teacher in our school system. And I want you to understand the heart that goes into this. It says, Hey, Barry, I saw in the paper yesterday the school board is looking at raising principal pay to retain them. That's great, and they deserve it. But what about the veteran teachers who didn't receive or got a minimal amount of a raise in September? The raises all went to the younger teachers. I do hope Cabarrus County will acknowledge the work that we have done over our careers to put and keep CCS at the top in North Carolina. We stayed even though our salaries were frozen. Mine was 12 years of my 24. Our longevity has been taken away. They capped our salary. Even though we met and exceeded every criteria DPI and county threw at us, we mentored and even taught all those young teachers who got a significant raise. Barry, I hope you will please say something about this at the meeting tonight. Veteran teachers went from qualifying for that 25% raise to nothing. What are we supposed to do? Who represents us if it's not you? Right now, I'm representing our principals. I try to represent our teachers every day, but we've got to, we've got to implore our citizens to understand what we're doing. And if you want good education for your children, you can't keep paying teachers at the bottom of the, and putting them on the bottom of the heap. This is not Wisconsin. And some, pe some people got a bad name for the Wisconsin because that was, those teachers there were union paid and they were entitled. This is not a group that feels entitled. This is a group that truly is professional, truly has risen above the occasion every time, and this is a group that needs to be rewarded, and we as taxpayers need to understand what we need to do to help our commissioners get to that point. We're not begging for big, big salaries. And this is not a big salary for them. It still doesn't get us anywhere close to the salary survey. It only gets us one-third of the way there just for them. We're trying to get a third of the way there for our teachers and non-certified, and we need help. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield. Thank you, Mr. Shoemaker. Mr. Shoe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Barry, I, too bad you're not running for re-election tomorrow. <laughs> I'd, 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 I'd vote for you. That was a good campaign speech, Barry. But, you know, I learned one of many things that I learned. I operated my own and operated, started from scratch my own business. And most of you that know me know that we, you know, had a very successful business. And one of the many things that I learned about people is it's a whole lot easier to retain good qualified people than it is to rehire and retrain good qualified people because it cost us money and uh, it's it, you know you got leaders like our principals for example their team their staff they go out and they search and they build a team they build a team just like a, a coach does with a football team 
he he recruits and drafts and tries to get anybody and everybody he can that meets the criteria that he's looking for to win games. And with principals, well, they want to win ball games too if they got ball teams. But then again, though, the academic success of a school is driven by the effectiveness of the principal. The principal, if he or she is effective, you've heard the old saying, the ship is no better than its captain. And so you've got to have good, qualified people, and you've got to pay those people. Now, one other, another thing that I learned, and that is, and it's still just as true today as it was when I was in business, and that is that people are motivated by money. There is no doubt they're motivated about it. And one, one more thing is this is, it can't always be about money, folks. Can you imagine what kind of a society we would live in if it was all based on money? What kind of doctors would we have? What kind of uh, rocket scientists that we have that, you know, do space exploration and all of that if it was all about the money? There has to be some type of dedication to what you went to school for, dedication and a purpose for why you're doing what you do. But on the other hand, though, People don't always see it that way because I had people that would go across the street or to the next company, they'd move for a dollar on the hour or 50 cents on the hour and, and drive 30 or 40 miles further to get that. My grandfather, he's done passed on now, but I, he'd drive clean across town to save a nickel on a gallon of milk. He didn't think about, you know, well, I could get it here and, and the gas wasn't 25 cents a gallon back then, but still drive a crane across town. The time time had to be worth something. But anyway, the, I don't I don't want to get off on all those real life stories and things, but this really is a real life story. You know, a lot of businesses, they give their employees uh, a merit increase. We don't have anything such as a merit increase. We don't have anything to reward our people. And I like the fact that this hopefully can be mirrored for our teachers and other staff members that are uh, that have been faithful too. You know, we got janitors out there, custodians, that's been here 15, 20, 25 years because every year at the retirement banquet, we have custodians retiring. We have media center people retiring and cafeteria people retiring. You, you know, they're important. Everybody is important because it's got to be a team effort, Dr. Shepard. From you, the coach, you know, the captain of the ship, it's got to be, uh, we've got to be cohesive and we've got to be a team. And unfortunately, you know, there's uh, the resources that we need to do what we want to do is just not there. And, you know, and Carolyn, you talk about, and we talked about this, you and I, we talked about Mecklenburg County. Well, I'm not going to say that we'll never be a Mecklenburg County because you don't just say never say never. But what I want, though, as a future county commissioner, is I want to see Cabarrus County be so good, have the absolute best education system in the state that people are going to want to come here. They're going to want to bring their businesses here. And the downside of that is they're going to bring their children here. So we got to build more schools and more schools, more businesses, more, 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 more. But that's the way it is. And so we can get competitive. We can. But the way it is right now, you know, we're looking at $19 billion in taxable assets for the county. Mecklenburg County, $300 billion. Their tax rate's 80.5. Ours is 70. So you see, it's very easy to see that the tax revenue is just not there. But the good thing about what we're talking about here tonight is that Ms. Klutz, you know, has found a way that she can take money from this area and put it in this area. And it's not going to really cost us anything because we're already got the, we've already got the money. And there's no sense if we added eight teachers, if we added eight teachers, when you look at the total, the big picture of all the classrooms that we have in Cabarrus County Schools, 12 to 1,500 classes, what kind of an effect would eight teachers have? But you're looking at this 4.27 or 4.29 percent increase will affect 105 administrators and it won't bring them up to where they need to be but it's a start and you know I, I applaud you both and the committee 
for trying to start something that's going to make things better. That's our job, to make things better for them, for the students, for the parents, and everybody that's involved. We've got to try hard to make it better. And if we have got the limited resources, then we ought to put them to best use. And I think that's what you're doing. And, uh, but the key thing is, is we need to try to retain. We don't want our people that we've spent time and money going here, going there, even out of state in some cases to recruit these highly qualified people to bring them to Cabarrus County Schools so that we can continue to increase our graduation rate. We can increase our academic statistics and all of these things. And we spend money to get them here. And then guess what? They stay around, like you said, maybe a year or two or three years. And they get to thinking and say, well, I can go next door. But yet, guess what? We paid, we paid to bring them here. We paid to tr teach them and train them and get them adapted to what we're doing in Cabarrus County Schools. And they take that to some other district and maybe even use it against us because it may help their academics go up. We're trying to get ours to go up. And, uh, but anyway, you know, I, I don't want to talk as long as Barry did, but you know, I'm behind this. I'm, I'm, I'm behind it. You still have time and you'll still be under. Yeah, well, well, you know, I'm, I'm for it because I, I think that these, you know, it's just, we don't live in the same society that we used to live in. When I was in elementary school, uh, Mr. Swearingen was the principal. He lived to be 100, by the way. He just died within the last year. But, you know, it was one principal and one librarian, and that was it. You know, they had four or 500 children at the old A.T. Allen School, but we didn't have the things that we have now. We didn't have uh, all the technology. And, and, and you've heard me mention this before. Kids today in the first grade, they're where I probably was in the third or fourth grade or fifth grade because of the, how things are, are being delivered now in the classroom and the technology that helps bring it there. So all in all, you know, it's good. And as a commissioner, I'm going to do my best, you know, do the best I can. I'll just do the best I can. And that's all I can do. So that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Shue. We appreciate your comments. Mr. Harrison. Well, I'm still singing Stand By Your Man in my head. I'm, so I, I can't get over that one. And Ms. Klein, I'm, I'm, I'm mad that you left English, but whatever, we'll take that offline. But you know, you <laughs> took your skills to a higher level, and that's what everybody in this room ought to do. Everybody's underpaid in some sense or another. And what we pay teachers is a crime in this state is a sin but it is what the market bears it's what the situation is all my talk in the world is not going to change the fact that that's what the state pays here is where we can incentivize our uh, management level staff and Barry I want to make them more uh, senior level managers than, than mid-level managers in your analogy there because um, here's what's going on in my mind two basic I mean, some basic economic lessons that go on in my mind in this recession that we've had now that we seem to be coming out of it in a long slow painful kind of way people who have skills are looking around and they're saying I can take these skills somewhere else and I'm going to vote with my feet if where I am is not going to pay me what I think I can get elsewhere. And that's no less true with our uh, uh, administrative level people. So they more so, to some extent or another, what we're dealing with here, uh, Dr. Shepard, is their mobility. They can pick up and they can go across the line and they can make a lot more uh, than they can here if they choose to jump out of the frying pan into the fire over in Mecklenburg. That's their business, I suppose. Maybe they'll come crying and screaming back to us in some uh, uh, time in the future. But they have a mobility that um, it's their right to exercise. And we're grateful to the ones, as we say, who, who um, are willing to stay here despite 
uh, some of those uh, financial burdens. And as our commissioner to be um, uh, sitting to my right here brings up, this is all based on tax receipts. Cabarrus County is getting some major employers coming into this area. We're going to have jobs in this area. Jobs pay salaries. Salaries have uh, tax rates affixed to them. People take those salaries after they've paid their income tax to the state and they go out and buy groceries and milk and bread and that becomes tax money that comes back to the counties and then they go buy properties and cars which are tax, taxable uh, income to the county as well and that's how our county commissioners come up with the funds for the most part to pay these supplements to any of our uh, teachers and staff. We also seem to be saying here that our uh, principals and assistant principals and um, uh, the people who run the schools. I tried to make a, myself a list. I'm sure I'll have something missed here. They seem to be our chief executive officers, our chief financials all at the schools, our uh, chief information officers, our chief security officers, at least our paralegal counselors, Maybe they're, they're our head cooks and bottle washers, too, at each school, but they have so many burdens and responsibilities on them. What's more, uh, Mr. Auerbach said that uh, he has 600, give or take, at his school. Well, that's 600 plus another 600 for each parent, so that's 1,800 immediate uh, customers that you've got, and you've got... I don't know the number of uh, staff or employees at your school, but that's how many uh, people you're uh, managing and dealing with. At Hickory Ridge High School, that becomes, I have to check my math now, 4,800 uh, customers, students and their parents at that school, plus the uh, number of staff uh, employees at that school to deal with, much less all the vendors that come and go all day long bringing uh, stuff to the school and our principals and assistant principals have to manage all of those crazy logistics that go on. I, I, my hat's off to you. I'm, I'm, it makes me dizzy to think of the responsibilities that you have, plus the safety, plus the safety. God, what a world we live in. I'll let that sink in. Thank you for doing what you do. But we've got to work with the county to provide the funds that we can because it don't grow on trees in the backyard. What we are saying here, though, is that this amount this year for these uh, uh, this block of principals and assistant principals is sustainable now and is, uh, your word er, earlier was re reoccurring, um, an accounting term that uh, I need to learn some of those, um, that is sustainable for the near future. But I'm, with all due respect, I'm going to hold you resp uh, not resp accountable to the, to the, basic understanding at this point at least that it is sustainable, that it is uh, reoccurring even though we are trying to get additional funding um, on top of this in the, in the future. This is what we need to keep um, the best of our best staff here and to reward them and incentivize them to keep on making this a good school system. and. Students need that leadership. Teachers need that support in order to make what happens in a school a success. And graduation rates and SAT scores and EOG scores don't just happen. They happen with a great deal of finesse, talent, skill, blood, sweat, and tears from the top of the principals down to um, everybody in the school dedicating their time and their a lot of their life uh, to helping our children become good, productive citizens. Um, did I speak as long as Mr. Shoemaker did? You're good, 
Oh, no, well, I'll let up too as well. Thank you for a great plan. Thank you for these reassurances that, that uh, we can man manage this um, going forward. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Harrison. Dr. Phillips, do you have any questions or comments? Well, as, as long as we're talking about Charlotte Mecklenburg luring away uh, some of our top administrators, I'd like to kind of take this in a different direction. Um, just before we started this meeting, there was a news flash that Charlotte Mecklenburg has lost their superintendent and will be recruiting a new one. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, can I ask our superintendent if he has any interest in that job? Go right ahead. I am extremely happy and proud to remain as the superintendent of the Cabarrus County Schools. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yes, it, well, we have it on tape, so you can't back down. All right, well, no. Uh, the only thing I'm going to say is, as far as I'm concerned, this action corrects a mistake that was made by our state legislature this summer when they gave um, other uh, certified staff a, uh, on average 7% raise, and yes, I know that a lot of them didn't get that much, um, and then gave our principals, uh, our leaders, uh, the 0.7%. Uh, that's just not right. And so by voting for this, I hope to correct that. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. And uh, to all of our my fellow board members, thank you very much for your impassioned uh, comments on something that is uh, overdue and um, I think that uh, one of the things that I'd like to do is um, thank all of you for being here uh, Adam and Michelle for presenting the rest of you for being you've sat here for three and a half hours hoping to hear good news when you leave and you know this was the easiest thing you did today Everything else was harder than this, and, and, and it's like that every single day. So we value each and every one of you. We value everyone that does the work that you do that's not sitting here, that, that's, that's out there. Uh, the, the level of integrity and professionalism in this district is unmatched, um, and, and it may sound somewhat cliched, but you know the, the, the way to get a journey started is to take the first step. And, and we, we, we did hit some of the, uh, the lower paid employees earlier. We have been asking. We're going to keep asking. If we can do this, then it certainly makes sense. Um, I was asked recently what innovative ideas that I have about dealing with uh, budget cuts to schools. And I had a very simple answer. And the answer was keep our current financer officer employed. Uh, period. End of story. With, to be able to take this and figure out a way to get this done so this board can take this action, we owe a tremendous amount of gratitude to you. So thank you very much for, for doing that. And without any further discussion, board members, I'd like a motion and a second that the supplement increase for building level administrators, principals, and assistant principals in full-time permanent position retroactive to July 1, 2014 be approved as presented. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Harrison. Second. A second by Mr. Walter. All those in favor say aye. May I have a point of privilege? You may. I, I would, I, I am making, I want the minutes to reflect. I am going to go with this, but with the only thing is they have promised me they are going to make sure that they do use this as a template to make sure that teachers and other employees will have something like this in place and I want to make sure that the minutes do reflect this uh, because again I do not like to see something what's good for the goose is good for the gander and this is the only reason that I will go along with this. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? That motion carries seven to zero. Okay, fantastic board members. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before uh, we uh, move forward, I would like to recognize Deputy Randy Buckwell. 
he is here for providing security. He was, uh, uh, wasn't here right when the meeting started, so I didn't recognize him, and typically we do. Randy, thank you very much for being here. We, we greatly appreciate it. And with that, board members, I need a, like a motion that we adjourn. So moved. I have a motion by Dr. Phillips. Second. A second by Mr. Shoemaker. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? This meeting is now adjourned.